Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, is it possible to identify somebody with psychopathy, a psychopath, by the language that they use? And there have been a number of studies that we've seen in the literature about this topic, and there's a particular interest around this idea of disfluencies. So I'll talk about this question, I'll answer this question, but also specifically about my thoughts on disfluencies. A disfluency is a word that interrupts a sentence, and the ones we think of usually are um and uh. Throughout this video, I'm sure I'll use a number of these, so you'll get a lot of examples of disfluencies there. So I'll put the references to the articles that I used for this video in the description for this video. And when we look at some of the more significant articles around psychopathy and language. We see that, of course, individuals that are psychopathic who are being studied are oftentimes in forensic environments, so they're in prison. And one of the studies I'll be using here was looking at specifically individuals who are psychopathic who are in prison who committed murder and comparing them to individuals who are not psychopathic who are in prison and committed murder. So is there a basis for this research? So if we take a look back a bit, if we step back from this, can language really be used to determine if somebody has personality characteristics or mental disorders? Well, we see in the literature that there's this idea that some language is unconscious, and therefore elements like word choice, productivity, so how many words somebody says in a certain period of time, and other patterns can be used to identify specific mental disorders. And some studies actually have shown that some of these methods are fairly reliable. So there is more or less a basis, but I'm skeptical. When I started to read these studies, and even when I was finished reading these studies, I remain a bit skeptical about how valuable language is in terms of identifying psychopathy specifically. So let's talk about the theory behind this. So the theory is that psychopathic language is going to be less cohesive than non-psychopathic language. We see as part of this theory that there's an instrumental nature to psychopathy. So there's a deliberate kind of goal orientation there. And also individuals who are psychopathic pay more attention to material needs and they're less worried about relationships and emotions. So we see an emotional deficit. So if we look just at these three areas, the instrumental nature, the focus on material goods or material gain, and the emotional deficit, we see support for all these theories, that these different elements point back to psychopathy. In terms of individuals who are psychopathic and committed murders, so psychopathic murders, the literature tells us that 93% of these types of murders had an external goal and that the murder was premeditated. When we look at non-psychopathic murders, that percentage drops to 48%. Now we also see a difference with the hierarchy of needs. So this would support that difference around the material gain. If we consider Maslow's hierarchy needs, for example, we see the basic needs like food, shelter, clothing at the bottom, and more complex needs up top. The highest need is self-actualization on that particular model. We see that psychopaths tend to focus on the basic needs and don't tend to worry too much about self-esteem, spirituality, and relationships. Now, in terms of the emotional deficit component, we see a lot of research that psychopaths have difficulty interpreting and experiencing emotions. They tend to produce fewer and less intense emotional words. They have more disfluencies. I talked about that before, and I'll get to that a little later in more detail. So again, words like um and uh, which tend to increase when individuals are facing multiple cognitive choices and demands. At least that's the theory. But again, I'll talk more about that in detail. And they tend to use language that reflects increased psychological distancing. So they tend to distance themselves from unpleasant events. So an example here would be using the past tense when something happened really just a few moments ago. So using the past tense more often is what we would align here with psychopathy. So all this information is taken together to form this theory that these differences would be reflected in language. So the main study I'm talking about here, again, is looking at psychopathic murders versus non-psychopathic murders in a forensic setting. 
So we're really talking about an unusual event and a very small population. That's important to keep in mind, and I'll talk more about that later as well, the limitations of this study. But what we see here is when individuals who were psychopathic and non-psychopathic were recalling the details of a homicide that they committed, there were some fairly significant differences between these two groups. The psychopaths indicated more cause and effect statements, so they demonstrated more goal orientation. We also saw that psychopaths use twice as many words related to basic and self-preservation type needs, like eating, drinking, and acquiring money. And money, of course, can be used to buy food and drink. So this may stand out to people because it seems unusual to use those type of basic need references when talking about something like homicide. But again, twice as many words related to these needs. And we see here that the non-psychopathic offenders, the non-psychopathic murderers, use more language related to family, religion, spirituality, and social needs. We see that the psychopathic murderers tended to use less emotionally intense descriptions of the crime, and they also used less emotionally pleasant language, so their language was more coarse. We see that the psychopathic language was substantially more disfluent than what we saw with the non-psychopathic murderers, and this means there were more disfluencies, again connecting back to this theory that there was more of a cognitive load. So the psychopaths had more difficulty putting the story together in a way that would appear appropriate. So this really emotionally charged event, a homicide, they were trying to manage their impressions. They were trying to appear a certain way to the interviewer. And this leads back to this theory again that that's why there's more disfluencies. That's why they say um and uh and like and so more often because they're trying to buy time to appear appropriate, to think of the right words to appear appropriate. So there are some interesting findings from this study, but does this study really tell us a lot about psychopathy and how we can spot psychopathy in everyday life? Well, I don't think it does, and I think one of the real difficulties here would be around the limitations. For example, the psychopathic murderers were recalling a homicide that they committed. This is a highly unusual situation for an individual to be in. First of all, somebody has to commit a homicide and then be arrested and convicted and sent to prison. And there's the effects of prison. These individuals were incarcerated for an average of 10 years. So there's just a lot of differences between a psychopath that would be encountered in the general public and the individuals here in this study. Another important element to keep in mind is the psychopathic murderers were more instrumental in the way they committed the crime. So perhaps the less emotional nature of their descriptions was simply a reflection of the type of crime they committed. So they really didn't have strong emotions necessarily at the time the murder was committed, so it really wouldn't be surprising that they weren't emotional when they recalled the homicide. Now there was another study that was published later on, and I'll include that reference too in the description, that talked about online communication and psychopathy. So really it tried to move this study, which again took place in a prison, out into the general public, specifically in text messaging, emails, and Facebook communications. And they did find that the psychological distancing was still there. They also found narcissistic components were still there. So in online communication, psychopaths tended not to refer to the other person in the conversation as much. And they saw that psychopaths produced less comprehensible text and used more hostile language, specifically interpersonally hostile language. So language that indicated a lot of anger and distress. So this other study really supports part of this finding we see in the original study. So some of these findings may be generalizable to a wider population. But there were some differences. For example, they found that in terms of basic needs, psychopaths and non-psychopaths couldn't be differentiated with online communication, meaning the psychopaths didn't stand out in terms of focusing more on basic needs when they were communicating online. Remember, this was a finding with the psychopathic murders. They did tend to reference basic needs more. So I'm looking for further research on this. I think this is an interesting set of studies, these two studies, and we've seen some other studies related to this as well. But I'm not convinced that you can really spot a psychopath from the different language they use.
So part of this I really want to expand on is this idea specifically of disfluencies in language. And this really speaks to why I'm skeptical that language can be used to identify psychopaths. It's not just the limitations of the study, it's the theory behind psychopathy and specifically how it relates to language. So what are disfluencies? Well, as I mentioned, disfluencies are times when somebody interrupts a sentence with a word like um, uh, so, well, like, or they might repeat a word. And there's a lot of theories about why people do this. This is actually remarkably common, right? We look around and we see disfluencies everywhere. We might see them less in formal speech and more in informal speech, but either way, they appear in both. So one theory here is that people are trying to think. They use disfluencies to pause so they can find the right word. And that's really the theory that was used in this paper with the psychopathic and non-psychopathic murders. So the idea here is that disfluencies are simply fillers. So somebody's just trying to stall to select a word that would be more appropriate. And the research actually doesn't really support this. There's some studies that show that this could be the case, but there are other studies that show that disfluencies are really words that we choose to use on purpose to signal a delay in how we're presenting our thought, to signal a delay in the narrative. And the theory here is that the word uh is used to signal a minor delay, and the word um is used to signal a major delay. So this really runs against this idea that disfluencies are unconscious and as people are trying to find the right word they're simply putting these disfluencies in without realizing it. This other theory suggests that they're deliberate. They're actually words that we use that have a purpose. So in essence they're not really superfluous although they're usually negatively looked at like a lot of people wish that they didn't use disfluencies and a lot of people would prefer that other people didn't use them but they do serve a purpose. And I don't think they're a signal of laziness or people not learning to speak a language correctly or anything like that. I think they're actually used to signal delays. I think this makes more sense. There's a study that talks about this. I'll put the reference to that one in the description of this video as well. One related theory that I want to mention here with disfluencies is the idea that perhaps disfluencies have become so popular because people don't want to be interrupted when they're talking. So they're talking to other people and they really want to maintain control of the conversation a little bit. So when they know a delay is coming, they put this disfluency in and that's like a placeholder. So it's really very consistent with the signaling of a delay. What they're saying is there's a delay coming and I don't want to be interrupted. And one of the ideas here that I think of is that perhaps narcissism, this increase in narcissism, has led to more use of disfluencies. So what I mean by this is Again, if somebody's trying to talk, and in general people tend to be more narcissistic, they're more concerned that somebody's going to interrupt. They're more concerned that people aren't good at conversation. They're not good at the balance, the back and forth. So they put these disfluencies in, again, to kind of keep things locked up, to make sure that they can hold the floor, and they can finish their thought. Now, another way to look at this is if you kind of run out of ideas in the middle of a sentence, you could use a disfluency to signal to somebody that they should interject. So there are a lot of different ways to look at disfluencies, but overall I think they are really more conscious than they are unconscious. And that's what I'm really getting at, is the theory behind why psychopaths use more disfluencies. I think that theory needs to be looked at more closely before drawing conclusions like we could identify psychopaths based on disfluencies. So with this study, a few people have wrote to me, they put comments on my channel or sent me emails, and they were concerned that they were psychopathic because they used disfluency. So that's why I really addressed this question, this disfluency question specifically, more thoroughly here. Now, if somebody uses words like um and uh and like and so and all that, to me that is not really a sign at all of psychopathy. I really wouldn't worry about that at all. There's other symptoms of psychopathy that would be more concerning, like if somebody's callous, unemotional, deceptive, manipulative, has a lack of empathy, elements like that. Yes, those would be more concerning. But using disfluencies, I'm not really worried about that. That in isolation doesn't tell me really anything about a person and how many psychopathic traits they may or may not have. I think what's happened with disfluencies is we see this increase in perfectionism 
So people are trying to eliminate every area of possible criticism. Again, this is highly consistent with an increase in narcissism, as I mentioned before. But I think that working to eliminate these fluencies, I think it's a noble effort. I think, again, it makes sense for formal conversation. But I also believe it comes at a cost. Somebody's really trying to focus their energy on being perfect and not using the signals that they've become accustomed to using. And this comes at the cost of not focusing on their topic. I would rather listen to somebody who uses disfluencies but tells the story the way they wanted to tell it. They tell the story accurately and with all the correct emotion infused that they want it. If that comes at the price of a few disfluencies, I'm okay with that. I'm worried that there's too much focus here on being perfect. We already see this emphasis on appearing physically perfect, where people don't want to have their picture taken or be recorded on video unless there's no flaws. And now we're moving to where people are paying attention to language and saying, oh, because you use um or uh, something's wrong with you. This is a dangerous trend, in my opinion. And again, I think this is so linked to narcissism and perfectionism, I'm just kind of worried about it. And then with the study coming out, and this came out some time ago, but again, people read it whenever, like they might have read it a month ago or a year ago, and all these concerns coming in about disfluencies and psychopathy, yes, this is not something I would worry about. I wouldn't really spend any time being concerned with disfluencies, especially when it comes to concerns about how it links to psychopathy. The reality, of course, is that any behavior can be problematic at a certain level. So if you find yourself using disfluencies all the time and people are always commenting on that and saying, look, it's distracting, I can't understand what you're saying, well, then maybe you want to look at it in terms of what you can do to reduce the use of disfluencies. But it still doesn't mean there's any psychopathy going on. Those are two completely different areas there. And again, I don't think it's logical to invest a lot of time being concerned about being a psychopath just based on some language tendencies. So moving back to these studies, yes, these types of studies are interesting, and psychopathy is an interesting topic. A lot of people are fascinated with psychopathy, sociopathy, narcissism, and even murders like serial killers. But we have to be careful about the kinds of connections we're making. We're taking really subtle signs, and these studies can be misinterpreted. It's certainly not the fault of people who produce the literature. It's more in how people interpret the literature. There needs to be a certain level of experience and training to interpret research literature. There are a lot of subtleties and nuances to research literature, so careful interpretation is really the key. So I know whenever I talk about psychopathy, sociopathy, and these different topics, and especially how these individuals can be identified, it generates a lot of interest and a lot of thoughts. If you have any thoughts on what I've mentioned in this video, if you agree or disagree, please put those thoughts in the comments. As always, I hope you found this description of psychopathy and language to be interesting. Thanks for watching.